Good afternoon. During today's legislative hearing, we will consider five bills. S4444, Crow Revenue Act. S4633, Northeastern Arizona Indian Water Rights Settlement Act of 2024. S4643, Zuni Indian Tribe Water Rights Settlement Act of 2024. S4705, Yavapai Apache Nation Water Rights Settlement Act of 2024. And S4998, the Navajo Nation Rio San Jose Stream System Water Rights Settlement Act of 2024. S4444 was introduced by Senator Daines. This bill would transfer subsurface mineral interest located within the Crow Tribes Reservation and currently held by a private owner, the Hope Family Trust, to the Crow Tribe and transfer the Hope Family Trust federal surface land and subsurface mineral rights on BLM lands in the Bull Mountains located outside of the Crow Tribes Reservation. S4633 was introduced by Senators Kelly and Cinema. This bill would resolve the water rights claims of the Navajo Nation, Hopi Tribe, and San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe in the Colorado River Basin in Arizona, authorize $5 billion in mandatory funding to implement the settlement, and create a 5,400-acre reservation for the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe in Arizona. S4643 was introduced by Senators Heinrich and Lujan, and the bill would resolve the Zuni tribe's water rights claims in the Zuni River Basin in New Mexico, authorize $685 million in mandatory funding for its implementation, and provide for the protection of Zuni Salt Lake, a place with great spiritual and cultural significance to the tribe by placing approximately 4,800 acres of land surrounding the lake into trust and withdrawing additional federal lands from future development. S4705 was introduced by Senators Kelly and Cinema. The bill would resolve the Yavapai Apache Nation water rights claims in the Verde River watershed in Arizona, which is part of the lower basin of the Colorado River, authorize $1 billion in mandatory funding to implement the agreement, and authorize a land exchange in Arizona between the Yavapai Apache and the U.S. Forest Service. Lastly, 4998, uh, Senator Heinrich and Senator Lujan's bill would resolve the Navajo Nation's water claims in the Rio San Jose Basin in New Mexico, authorize nearly $224 million in mandatory funding to implement the settlement, and authorize the expansion of the Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project to serve Navajo communities in the Rio San Jose Basin that are outside it, its current service area. Before I turn to Vice Chair Murkowski for her opening statement, I would like to extend a welcome and thank our witnesses for joining us today. I look forward to your testimony and to our discussion. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the hearing on these important bills. Um, I'm going to be brief again. Each of these bills would address longstanding water and lands issues while also promoting tribal self-determination in water resources, housing, and tribal energy sovereignty. And I want to just commend and thank the parties um, I know you've put a lot of work behind each of these respective matters, and I appreciate uh, the, the work and the effort that has gone into that. Starting first with S4633, this settlement bill would resolve decades of litigation that has locked up the water rights of the Navajo Nation, the Hopi tribe, mm -hmm. and the southern San Juan Paiute tribe to the Colorado River. If enacted, this bill would authorize the construction of a drinking water delivery system to provide piped water to hundreds of native homes for the first time ever. This is significant. I must say that I am concerned about a big price tag, over $5 billion, but I look forward to hearing more about the settlement and how that money will be spent at the hearing. Um, finally, I want to mention S4444, the Crow Revenue Act. This bill is modeled on the Northern Cheyenne Lands Act from 2014 that we enacted into law from this committee. It would authorize the transfer of federal coal in the Bull, Mountain, Bull Mountains Mine to the Hope family and in exchange require the Hope family to transfer their coal rights within the boundaries of the Crow Reservation to the Crow Tribe. This exchange is predicated on the Hope family entering into a revenue sharing agreement with the Crow Tribe, but these revenues would help the tribe offset the loss of royalties that have been caused by the closure of, of a mine. The Crow Tribe is located in the Power Basin, the largest coal producing region in the country, and it's long depended on coal mining royalties and tax revenue to fund essential tribal government services for its neighbors, including care for the elders. I know that there are, there are some that are concerned that this would continue coal production, but we are talking about uh, the Crow Tribe, which has a sovereign right to develop its economic assets. So I'm looking forward 
to hearing the views of our panelists today on this issue and, and these water settlement bills that are before us. And again, I really want to recognize the, the longstanding efforts of so many that have gone into it. I know it's not easy, and I commend you. We are going to, we have a number of opening statements and members wishing to introduce the testifiers. So just so you know the run of show, according to my script, we will, uh, we will start with Senator Lujan, then Danes, then Heinrich, then Kelly, then Cortez Masto. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly why, Catherine, you're the last, but it will be all right. <laughs> Senator Lujan. Thank you, Chair Schatz and Vice Chair Murkowski for holding this important legislative hearing today especially given the unprecedented efforts by tribes to have Congress ratify their Indian water rights settlements after years, sometimes many decades, prayers, and negotiations. I have the honor today of introducing Governor Kukati of Zuni Pueblo. Governor, thank you for all of your leadership in helping to advance the Zuni Indian Tribe Water Rights Settlement Act of 2024, this Congress. The governor has served in this position since 2020, 2023 and is also the secretary of the All Pueblo Council of Governors, which represents the 20 Pueblo nations of New Mexico and Texas. The governor was previously a member of the Tribal Council for over 18 years and served two terms as the chairman of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Prior, the governor served in different roles, including working with the Zuni radio station, its housing authority, and dedicated himself to Zuni language revitalization efforts. The governor has dedicated his career to protecting Zuni way of life, its people, and I'm glad that he is here today to testify on behalf of this historic bill that I co-lead with Senator Heinrich, which will protect Zuni's water rights in the Zuni River and its sacred Salt Lake. Governor, I welcome you and I thank you for your steadfast leadership on this effort and in so many others. Mr. Chairman, thank you and I yield. Thank you very much. Senator Danes. Chairman Schatz, thank you. Schatz. Schatz, thank you. Thank you. And Vice Chair Murkowski. Uh, I'm proud to be able to introduce Chairman Frank White Clay of the Crow Nation. I have memories going back to days in grade school, Longfellow and Bozeman, when the old coyotes lived about three doors down. And Barney... Rachel's dad was a Crow code talker. I had no idea someday that we'd be sitting here and myself as the center, you as the chairman, having this conversation about Indian country and the Crow tribe, but it's an honor to have you here, sir, and thank you. Uh, the chairman's been a fierce proponent of tribal sovereignty and self-determination. This year alone, the chairman and I have worked extensively to craft and push forward the Crow Tribe Water Rights Settlement Amendments Act which passed the committee just last week, and then the Crow Revenue Act, which we'll be hearing more on today. Chairman Schatz, thank you for your help in uh, getting this hearing uh, set up for today. As I'm sure the chairman will tell us all shortly, the Crow Revenue Act is critical for the Crow tribe. And this bill couldn't come at really a more important time. With the recent closure of the Absalica mine, the Crow tribe will be able to supplement the loss of that revenue with the new revenues in this bill. This is a win for the Crow tribe. It's a win for our local communities, and it's also a win for the state, which is why I'm proud to say that we have tremendous local support, statewide elected officials, as well as the affected counties. And as the chairman of the Crow tribe will say soon, and I will not speak for you, you speak very well for yourself, Mr. Chairman. I think you're gonna hear that from the Crow Tribe as well. I'm excited to hear more from Chairman White Clay. Thanks for making the long journey back to DC to represent your people here in Washington. Senator Heinrich. Thank you, Chairman Schatz and Vice Chairman Murkowski. And I, I wanna start and just thank you uh, both for considering the Indian Buffalo Management Act a few minutes ago. Um, that legislation will further support growth of uh, tribal bison herds and I am very grateful for the committee's support. Turning to the hearing agenda, uh, I wanna thank you for holding this hearing on the Zuni Indian Tribe Water Rights Settlement Act and the Navajo Nation Rio San Jose Stream System Water Rights Settlement Act. That's a mouthful, but two incredibly important bills uh, to the future of water for New Mexico's tribes. Uh, I am pleased to welcome the Governor of Zuni Pueblo, Arden Kukate, who is here today to provide testimony on the Zuni Water Rights Settlement Act, 
The Zuni people have been stewards of the Zuni River Basin for millennia. Their traditional agricultural practices and careful stewardship of water sustained the tribe over thousands of years. And unfortunately, the United States has failed to protect Zuni's water rights and has allowed their water to be diverted to other purposes. Overuse of water in the Zuni Basin has caused the Zuni people to suffer from a lack of water for their community, their businesses, and their traditional agricultural practices. This injustice continues today. Without reliable access to clean water, it is difficult for Zuni to attract new businesses that create jobs and revenues for the tribe. This legislation would not only fully settle Zuni's water rights claims in the Zuni River Basin, it would also provide funding for several key water infrastructure projects. It is an opportunity for the United States to make the Zuni tribe whole for the water that they have always been entitled to. And it will support Zuni's traditional irrigation practice, their people, and their future business development in a manner that builds res resilience in the face of a drying climate. This piece of legislation would also protect the Zuni Salt Lake, a sacred place of great cultural significance to the Zuni tribe and others in the region. I'm also very happy to welcome President of Navajo Nation, Dr. Boo Nigren, who is here to provide testimony for the Navajo Nation Rio San Jose Stream System Water Rights Settlement Act. Uh, this legislation would settle the water rights of the Navajo Nation in the Rio San Jose Basin. It is the final step in an adjudication process that began more than 40 years ago. And in that time, we have seen a ratification of the Southwest further strain water resources for tribes, including the Navajo Nation, that don't have the resources to fully use their water rights. This settlement is an important step towards giving the Navajo Nation an equal voice amongst water users in the Southwest. Today, there are more than 200 Navajo households within the Rio San Jose and Rio Puerco basins without access to running water. These households instead have to rely on hauling water. The lack of reliable drinking water systems in these communities contributed to the widespread health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the Navajo Nation, which took the lives of far too many. I'm committed to working with the Navajo Nation to build a future where they have full access to their water rights, and this access to water will facilitate the preservation of Navajo culture and tradition. Both of these pieces of legislation would implement settlement agreements that have been carefully negotiated between the tribes, the state of New Mexico, neighboring, wa neighboring water users, and the United States. And I want to thank all of the parties for their tireless work in reaching settlements for these basins, and of course, my colleague, Senator Lujan, who is co-sponsoring these settlements along with me. The failure of the United States to work with tribal governments to ensure that they could use the water that they have always owned has reverberated through generations, and it has a direct impact on the well-being of tribal members today. It's time we make this right for Zuni and for the Navajo Nation, and I want to thank you, uh, say thank you to the entire committee for your consideration today, and yield back my time. Thank you very much. Senator Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to take this opportunity to welcome Frank Whiteclay. Uh, Frank, uh, we appreciate you being here again. He's back, uh, fighting for uh, fighting for the Crow people. I, I just want to point something out. We, we all in this committee work with Native American tribes all the time. Crows had their challenges with past administrations, uh, but Frank has stepped up in a big, big way, cleaned up what I think was an incredible mess, and uh, has got the tribe going in the right direction. Frank, we appreciate your leadership. Thank you, Senator Tester. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Schatz and Vice Chair Murkowski for holding this hearing today on these important bills um, before the committee. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about S-4633, the Northeastern Arizona Indian Rights Settlement Act of 2024. This is an important bill. I support it. I agree that it is past time we reach fair and equitable resolutions to some of the longstanding water management issues in the Southwest. It is important we get the, right, the details right. Um, but I do believe we need to ensure there's collaboration with stakeholders across the Colorado River Basin. Uh, I have a letter for the record, Mr. Chairman, from the Southern Nevada Water Authority in my state, who also supports this legislation. But because of the intricacies and nuances resulting from the inner basin um, and interstate nature of, of the Colorado River with the tribal lands, 
uh, believes that collaboration is key. And that's all we're looking for is to avoid any unintended consequences and to remain consistent with the compact in the Colorado River. Um, SNWA is respectfully proposing that Congress, the Basin States, and the tribes work together on technical modifications to 4633. And that's what uh, I will be looking for. So I would like to submit this letter for the record. Without objection. Thank you. Um, I'm committed to working with everyone to get this done. Uh, 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 and so I appreciate uh, the tireless effort that's been put into it. And I know what that is like. So please include us as, uh, at the table to make sure this gets this bill passes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'd like to thank you and the vice chairwoman to, uh, for including the Northeastern Arizona Indian Water Rights Settlement Act and the Yavapai Apache Nation Water Rights Settlement Act in today's hearing. It's my honor to introduce Navajo President Boo Nigren, Hopi, Chair, Ch Hopi Chairman Timothy Nuvanyama, Yavapai Apache Nation Chairwoman Tanya Lewis, and San Juan Southern Paiute Vice President Johnny Leahy. President Nigren was elected to serve as the 10th Navajo Nation President in November 2022. President Nigren has a doctorate from the U University of Southern California. He has been involved closely with leading the Navajo Nation through the negotiation of the Northeastern Arizona Water Rights Settlement. Chairman Nuvanyama has led the Hopi Council since his election as chairman in 2018. He served as a tireless advocate for the Hopi and has been instrumental in negotiations that enabled the Northeastern Arizona Water Rights Settlement to come together. Chairwoman Lewis is an important voice in the Verde Valley before her election as chairwoman, she served as vice chair and has been on the council since 2010. She's been personally involved in working with parties across the Verde Valley to come to consensus and develop a settlement that is designed for the future. Vice President Leahy Jr. currently serves as the vice president of the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe. He was first elected to the council in May of 2022 and served as president prior to his current role. Vice President Leahy is serving on the council in the footsteps of his father, Johnny Leahy Sr., who served on the tribal council when the tribe was originally recognized in December of 1989. President Nigren, Chairman Nuvanyama, and Vice President Leahy, I want to commend you for your commitment to your communities. The fact that you have all come together after decades and multiple attempts at a settlement is truly historic, and you and your team should be recognized for your dedication to this large and complex settlement. The Northeastern Arizona Indian Water Rights Settlement Act will bring safe and reliable drinking water to your tribal communities in Arizona, establishing a homeland for the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe. It's important to note that on the Navajo Nation, Approximately 30% of homes do not have access to safe and reliable drinking water. This settlement is an enormous step forward for securing your tribe's water future and providing certainty for Arizona and the entire Colorado River Basin. Without the settlement, a cloud of uncertainty will remain over tribal water claims in the Col Colorado River Basin, and tens of thousands of tribal members will continue to struggle to meet their basic needs. Chairwoman Lewis, I want to thank you and everyone who has been a part of the Yavapai Apache Nation settlement process for your dedication. The nation and the parties have worked hard over 15 years to complete the settlement. Working with the Bureau of Reclamation, the parties evaluated, evaluated numerous water sources and potential infrastructure options to achieve a reliable and sustainable water supply to meet the nation's current and future permanent tribal homeland needs. Ultimately, the delivery of C.C. Cragen water through the Cragen Verde pipeline is the best option. The settlement protects local groundwater aquifers from overpumping and thereby preserves these resources that are needed to meet the nation's water demands under its settlement budget. By reducing the capture of groundwater that feeds the Verde River, it also protects base flow that supports the Verde River. 
So this settlement helps to ensure Arizona's water future both in the valley and downstream. I urge my colleagues to support both of these important bills as they move through the committee process. Again, Chairman Schatz and Vice Chairman Murkowski, I want to thank you for holding today's hearing on these two important and historic bills. And finally, we are pleased to uh, uh, welcome again to the committee uh, probably the most frequent of frequent flyers, uh, uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Interior, Brian Newland. Um, before we begin, I want to remind our witnesses that your full written testimony will be made part of the official hearing record, and so we would just ask you to try to confine your remarks to five minutes or fewer so that we have uh, time for questions. Assistant Secretary Newland, uh, please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm trying to rack up those miles. Ani Buju, good afternoon. Chairman Schatz, uh, Vice Chair Murkowski, members of the committee. Uh, I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the Department of the Interior to present our testimony on a number of Indian water rights settlement bills, as well as the Crow Revenue Act today. The United States has a trust obligation to protect the continued existence of Indian tribes. And this means ensuring that each tribe has a protected homelands where its citizens can maintain their tribal existence and way of life. And water is essential to meeting this obligation. S-4633, the Northeastern Arizona Indian Water Rights Settlement Act, will provide reliable and safe water for the Navajo Nation, the Hopi Tribe, and the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe. The settlement authorizes $5 billion for essential water development and delivery projects. It would establish a homeland for the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe, and it would allow the Navajo Nation and the Hopi Tribe to lease their water. Approval of this settlement would mark the resolution of longstanding claims and conflicts over water in northeastern Arizona. It would be an historic milestone in our nation's efforts to ensure access to water for native people in their homelands. And it would benefit so many others in this drought-stricken region. The department supports the goals and purposes of S-4633. Our written statement highlights some of the important issues that still need to be addressed in the legislative language to ensure this settlement can be successfully implemented. That includes working with Congress to ensure there's enough funding to support the projects in the settlement. But I want to be clear on the bigger picture. We're closer than we've ever been before in reaching a final settlement here. We're prepared to work with the sponsors, with the tribes and other parties to address those issues so we can fulfill our trust obligations to these tribes and have this settlement enacted in this Congress. The Yavapai Apache Nation Water Rights Settlement Act, S-4705, authorizes more than $1 billion to build and maintain essential water infrastructure for the tribe. The settlement would provide the nation with confirmed rights of 4,600 acre feet per, of, per year of water, promote water conservation, and protect the flow of the Verde River. S-4705 also includes a land exchange with the Forest Service to lands that are contiguous with the Middle Verde Reservation. The department supports the goals of this bill, and we recognize that further discussions need to be had regarding the cost and size and scope of this project. S-4998, in combination with S-595, would settle all tribal rights in the Rio San Jose Basin, bringing stability to the basin for all water users. S-4998 would provide funding to allow the Navajo Nation to plan water infrastructure for the current and long-term water needs of its people, and the department supports this bill. The Department of the Interior is also pleased to support S-4643, the Zuni Indian Tribe Water Rights Settlement Act. This bill follows decades of litigation and is the product of more than a decade of good faith negotiations. S-4643 is designed to meet the Zuni tribe's current and long-term needs for water by providing trust funds to be used by the tribe according to its own decisions. Rather than committing the Zuni tribe or the United States to construct specific projects, the bill would allow the tribe to make decisions regarding when, where, and how to develop water infrastructure on its lands. S-4444 would convey approximately 4,600 acres of the Hope Family Trust mineral estate located within the boundaries of the Crow Reservation to the Crow Tribe. 
It would also convey approximately 4,500 acres of mineral estate and approximately 940 acres of surface estate managed by the BLM to the Hope Family Trust. The bill requires that the Crow Tribe notify the Secretary when the Tribe and the Hope Family Trust have agreed on a formula for revenue sharing from development of the minerals conveyed to the Tribe, should they be developed at a later date. The Department supports this bill's goals of consolidating Tribal ownership of resources on the reservation and also providing an additional source of revenue for the Crow Tribe. We'd like to work with the sponsor on some modifications to the uh, that we believe would improve this bill. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to provide the department's views on these water bills and uh, the Crow Revenue Act. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Chairman White Clay. Welcome. Please proceed with your testimony. <clears throat> um, thank you, Honorable Chairman and Honorable Members of the Committee. Thank you for having this. I am Frank White Clay. I'm the chairman of the Crow Nation. I'm here today to express our full support for S4444, the Crow Revenue Act. The legislation addresses crucial land management issues, generates opportunity for economic growth, and reaffirms the sovereignty of the Crow tribe by consolidating our ownership of ancestral lands. This bill provides an equitable resolution to longstanding land and resource management challenges on the Crow Reservation and strengthens our future as a tribe. The Crow Revenue Act would transfer approximately 4,660 acres of private subsurface and holdings as the Hope family tracks on the Crow Reservation to the Crow tribe. In exchange, the tri tribe would transfer 4,530 acres of federal subsurface and 940 acres of federal surface interests in Muscle Shell County referred at to as the Bull Mountain Tracks. A key provision of the bill requires that the Crow Tribe and the Hope family enter into a revenue sharing agreement for any development of the Bull Mountain Tracks. This would provide a crucial revenue stream for the Crow Tribe as we seek to revitalize our economy. This bill mirrors the bipartisan Northern Cheyenne Lands Act of 2014, which successfully addressed similar issues for the Northern Cheyenne Tribe. S4444 offers the same pragmatic solution. It resolves private inholdings on a reservation while creating much needed economic opportunities for the tribe, ensuring development uh, for development in Muscle Shell County. The legislation mandates a three party land exchange involving the Crow Tribe, the Hope Family Trust, and the United States government. The Secretary of the Interior is required to convey approximately 4,530 acres of federal subsurface and 940 acres of federal surface interests at Bull Mountain to the Hope Family Trust. In exchange, the Hope Family Trust will convey 4,660 acres of subsurface within the boundaries of the Crow Reservation to the Crow Tribe upon request by the Tribe. The Secretary is directed to take these lands into trust for the benefit of the Crow Tribe. The land exchange will allow the Tribe to consolidate our ownership and control lands within the reservation, a crucial step in managing and developing our natural resources. The legislation provides the potential for a critical revenue stream for the Crow Tribe if the Bull Mountain tracks are developed. With the exp expedited closure of the Absaluga mine on the Crow Reservation, which provided substantial royalties to the tribe, these revenues would help mitigate the economic impact and support the tribe's stability. The Crow tribe has always depended on our lands and natural resources for survival. Over centuries, the tribe has made supreme sacrifices to reclaim and maintain our homeland. Since the Treaty of 1851 and 1886, the tribe's land base has been continuously reduced from over 38 million acres spanning Montana and Wyoming to just 2.3 million acres today. This bill addresses a central element of our struggle, consolidating our land base and securing our right to manage and benefit from our resources. As a result of these land losses, the tribe faces significant economic challenges, including limited access to employment, development opportunities on the reservation. The transfer of 4,660 acres of subsurface on the Crow Reservation to the tribe is critical to allowing us to exercise full control over future development. <clears throat> the tribe has also been denied access to federal grants and incentives 
due to invalid debts referred to the Treasury Offset Program, also known as the Do Not Pay List. This prevented the Crow Tribe from benefiting from many new programs created and funded during the COVID-19 pandemic, which it was otherwise eligible for. Fortunately, our administration was able to clear this issue with the help of our Montana delegates. And then, however, we will not be able to retroactively receive these awards. Restoring our economic independence through land and resource management will help mitigate these lost funds and strengthen the tribe's future by providing much needed resource to help develop an economy. The Crow Revenue Act is not just a land exchange, it is an investment in the future of the Crow tribe. I urge the committee and the Senate to support this critical legislation, which will help the Crow tribe overcome long-standing, long-standing challenges and build a brighter future for my people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman White Clay. Uh, President Nigren, nice to see you again. Please proceed with your testimony. Yeah. Yate, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chairwoman Murkowski, and members of the committee. I'm Dr. Boo Nigren, Navajo Nation President. I'm joined today by Navajo Nation Council Speaker Kristen Curley, uh, Chairman Timothy uh, Nuvengama of the Hopi Tribe, and Vice President Johnny Lehigh, as well as the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of S4633. S4998. Thank you to Senators Kelly and Simona, who were here earlier for sponsoring S4633. Senators Heinrich and Lujan, who were here earlier as well, sponsoring 4998. Uh, your collective leadership in securing a safe, certain, and stable water supply for the nation will be felt for generations. The Navajo Nation is the largest indigenous nation in the country. We provide critical governmental services to over 400,000 tribal members. Half of these members reside on our sovereign territory, which is roughly the size of West Virginia, spans Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. Roughly a third of the Navajo Nation households lack running water, and that is how I grew up without running water. Thousands of our people continue to haul water over 30 miles round trip on un unpaved dirt roads, washboard roads, to meet the daily water demands. And hauling water is in incredibly expensive. Families that haul water on the Navajo Reservation spend the equivalent of $43,000 per acre foot compared with $600 per acre foot from, from a typical suburban water user in the region. This water is among the most expensive in the country for a population that is among the poorest. Congress must act to end the water crisis on the Navajo Nation. First, I will speak on S4633, which will ratify a historic water rights settlement among the Navajo Nation, the 38 other parties, including the Hopi Tribe and the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe, the United States, and the state of Arizona. It will put to rest decades of expensive litigation and will bring certainty to users throughout the Colorado River Basin. Once confirmed by Congress, the settlement agreement will ratify and confirm the tribe's respective water rights, including our rights to the Arizona Upper Basin and Lower Basin Colorado River. It will also invest in needed water, water infrastructure that will deliver safe and reliable drinking water to the three settling tribes. Because of the unique geography and hydrology of the Navajo Nation, our reservation spans the Upper Basin and the Lower Basin of the Colorado River. In order to effectively provide the water to the Navajo communities, the nation needs the ability to move our Colorado River water between the basins. This legislation authorizes the movement of the water as Congress has done before. I understand that certain upper basin states have concerns with wh where Navajo can use its water. Navajo is cooperatively working with the states to find a path forward. Navajo is also working with the U.S. to address issues raised in its testimony, and we have made great progress. Next, I would like to turn to S4998, which authorizes a settlement that resolves the nation's water rights. It claims in the Rio San Jose Basin and address our claims in the Rio Perco Basin. This agreement ends four decades of litigation and will bring needed water to some of the driest basins in New Mexico. This bill complements the Acuma and the Laguna settlement for the Rio San Jose that is authorized in S-595. These water rights settlement agreements provide a comprehensive settlement of tribal claims in the Rio San Jose basin. The Navajo Nation will use settlement funding to import water to the Rio San Jose and Rio Perco basin. These water imports will help water users to manage depleted surface and groundwater. 
passage of this settlement will make a real difference in the lives of many people in our eastern Navajo communities. It will provide a path forward towards water security for the people living in these basins, including the Pueblo of Laguna and Acoma. These settlements are an important priority for my administration. I understand the challenges associated with hauling water because I did it until I was 19 years old. This is an expensive, physically demanding, and incredibly time-consuming to haul water. It is absolutely unacceptable. In 2024, more than one-third of our people, including our children and our elders, do not have running water. Therefore, I respectfully urge the committee to swiftly pass these bills to ensure that our children will have access to what the rest of this country takes for granted, a safe and reliable water supply. These settlements represent the hope for a better and brighter future for my people. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. We will now welcome virtually the Honorable Timothy Nuvangyama, the chairman of the Hopi tribe in Arizona. Mr. Chairman. Chairman Schatz, Vice Chairman Murkowski, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity and privilege to testify today in support of S. 4633, the Northeastern Arizona Indian Water Rights Settlement Act. My name is Timothy Navangyama, and I have the honor of serving as the chairman of the Hopi tribe. I want to apologize to the committee for not being there today in person with you all, but I'm recovering from surgery and unable to travel at the moment. I thank the committee for allowing me to participate virtually. I am Tobacco Clan from the village of Masungnavi. I do not carry today's message alone. So I do want to recognize Vice Chairman Craig Andrews and the members of the Hopi Tribal Council who are strong advocates for our Hopi people. I also want to thank Senator Kelly, Senator Sinema, and the entire Arizona delegation for their work on this important legislation. This settlement stems from 50 years of negotiations. For years, many thought it would be impossible for all the parties to come together and find compromise. However, here we are today. It is no secret that Arizona and much of the West is in a water crisis. I am proud that the parties were able to come together in the midst of this crisis to produce a settlement that will benefit all of our communities and offer all of our future generations water security. Our ancestors have resided in Northeastern Arizona since time immemorial. Upon emergence into this world, our people encountered the deity who I'll refer to in English as the original caretaker, who gave us blessings to live on the land. The caretaker required our ancestors to follow in his path as humble farmers and to respect the land. Since our ancient time, we have remained in Hopitetskwa, our traditional homeland where we still reside today. Untold generations of Hopisinum have lived on this land preserving and conserving our water. When the United States created the Hopi Reservation, it cut us off from much of our Hopitetskwa. The United States landlocked and waterlocked us completely, surrounded us with the Navajo Reservation. The Hopi Reservation stands separated from many of our traditional water sources. The current water supplies on the reservation cannot sustain our population or growth into the future. Unlike others, Hopi cannot simply move away to where there is more water. We have a sacred covenant with the original caretaker to be stewards of this land. Our culture, tradition, and religion are tied to this place. We cannot and will not leave. Fortunately, this settlement act will ensure that my people have water for our current and future needs. The settlement act will accomplish several things. It will allow Hopi to continue to fulfill our covenant with the original caretaker to act as stewards to Hopitetskwa. It will provide the Hopi tribe, Navajo Nation, and San Juan Southern Paiute with reliable water. It will construct the Inapa Batuakati pipeline to serve the tribes. It will provide us with reliable upper basin water. It will ensure that groundwater is managed appropriately it will create multiple trust funds for the tribes to plan, construct, and operate water supply infrastructure, and it will create certainty for non-Indian communities. I understand and appreciate the cost of this settlement act. 
This settlement covers more Native Americans than any other in U.S. history. It addresses the severe infrastructure challenges caused by decades of federal neglect. On our reservation, approximately 30% of Hopis lack running water. Settling our water claims means nothing if water doesn't reach our homeland. The infrastructure that can accomplish this expensive but necessary. This isn't just its statistic, it's Hopi's reality. My good friend and Hopi Tribal Vice Chairman Andrews holds his, holds his own water today to provide for his home. The settlement will fix that for his family and the many others living without running water. Water is sacred. Water is our life. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today virtually, and I do welcome any questions that you may have. Okwa, thank you for giving me this time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Now we are happy to uh, welcome and introduce the Honorable Johnny Lehi, Jr., Vice President of the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe in Arizona. Welcome. Mike, the Hoya, Tata Wansing, Nut Shoa Watsi Monica, Nuna Niai, John Lee High Jr., Nut Bayot Zingu, Namu Karaku. I want to thank uh, Chairman Schatz and Vice Chairman Murkowski for allowing us to and testify today about Senate Bill 4633. I also like to thank Senator Kelly and Senator Cinema for their unwavering support in moving this bill forward. My name is John Lee High Jr. I am Vice President of the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe. For the Paiute Tribe, this bill is is about so much more than just water. Not only does the historic bill resolve water rights for three tribes and represent the efforts of 39 parties, the Paiutes, it is a resolution to several decades of living in, as strangers in our own homeland. It provides our members with water and it ratifies a 24-year-old treaty to establish and recognize the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe Reservation. I have lived in Hidden Springs my entire life. It is a small community that the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe members located near Tupa City, Arizona. Importantly, Hidden Springs sits within the boundaries of the Navajo Reservation. My family has been in this area for generations growing up as it was always difficult to understand why Paiutes have been living in this same area for so long and yet don't have exclusive reservation in it are considered outsiders in our own homeland. <clears throat> we are hopefully we we are hopeful the Senate F Bill 4633 will rectify this unfortunate reality. The San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe is a small tribe located in northern Arizona and southern Utah within the boundaries of the Navajo Reservation. Most people don't know that the large part of the Navajo Reservation was actually set aside by Congress for the Navajo, Hopi, and San Juan Southern Paiute Tribes in 1934. While the Paiute Tribe has shared this territory with the Navajo Nation for more than 160 years, our tribe was in this area long before the relocation or encroachment of other tribes. As the only federally recognized tribe in Arizona without exclusive reservation, we are unable to take advantage of basic services like funding opportunities that will provide tribal members with livable homes, running water, and electricity, all because we are a tribe without a homeland. Generations of San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe have come and gone without ever seeing the creation of exclusive homeland. The mental emotional impact of being a landless homeless tribe is something I wouldn't wish upon anyone. The Senate Bill 4633 will absolutely change things for my tribe. You've heard about the water rights, including the legislation, and you'll hear more about the pipeline project and ability to provide people with safe, reliable drinking water. The water rights and the pipeline are crucial to all three tribes. For my tribe, S4633 will ratify a treaty between the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe and Navajo Nation that our tribe was, has waited for more than 24 years to see become reality. This treaty will create a San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe res reservation made up of 5,100 acres in southern area near Tuba City, Arizona, and additional 300 acres in the southern Utah. All, all of this land is currently located within the Navajo Reservation. Senate Bill 4633 will not only ratify the treaty that creates our reservation, but also provides the water we need to make our reservation a true homeland for our people. The funding provided by 4633 will help create infrastructure necessary to serve our tribal members. The tribe without, a tribe without a land is a tribe without a future. 
Land is what allows tribes to develop epo- economic opportunities, generate revenue, and continue to pass down our way of life to our children and children's children. My kids are starting to ask me the same question I struggled with when I was young. Why don't we have a reservation? Why can't our people get running water or graze animals? Now, thanks to S4633, <clears throat> I have positive and hopeful answers for them that include a real possibility of someday soon providing my people, including my children, with the opportunity to build a future on the reservation. With your help, this treaty, this promise, the Navajo Nation and the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe made each, made each other 24 years ago can finally be ratified. Please support Senate Bill 4633 and help my people claim our small piece in this world. Thank you, Senate. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice President. Now we are pleased to introduce and welcome the Honorable Arden Kukati, the governor of the Zuni tribe in Zuni, New Mexico. Good afternoon, my sincere thanks to you, Chairman Schatz and Ranking Member Murkowski for holding this hearing and giving me the opportunity to testify. I also want to thank Senators Heinrich and Lujan for their co-sponsorship of our water settlement bill. Sunni's reservation is the largest of the Mexico's 19 pueblos containing almost a half a million acres within the Zuni River Basin in New Mexico. Carved out from our ancestral homelands, it is located in a very rural area of western New Mexico and is home to close to 10,000 members. Long before the coming of the Spanish conquistadors, we grew corn, squash, beans, and other food crops in our main village along the Zuni River and in surrounding satellite communities along tributary streams and springs, often using an irrigation technique that we are famous for, waffle gardens. Our adoptive irrigation techniques and careful stewardship of our water and lands allowed us to irrigate thousands of acres of land. Not surprisingly, our prayers and traditions focused on the importance of water and agriculture to our existence. Our water supply was relatively stable until the late 19th century when the settlers upstream of our reservation began diverting and storing virtually the entire flow of the Zuni River's primary tributary. Clear cutting of the forest in the Zuni Mountains compounded our water supply woes, causing severe erosion and clogging our waterways with silt. Consequently, the Zuni River, once a perennial stream running through the heart of our village, is now a bare trickle. Unfortunately, instead of taking action to stop these upstream diversions by newcomers to the valley, the federal government encouraged settlement by non-Indians through a poorly conceived attempt to centralize Zuni farming away from lands near our eastern and northern borders. Disregarding our traditional farming practices, the government constructed a series of dams and reservoirs within our reservation. The construction of the first and largest dam at what is called Black Rock buried Zuni Sacred Spring, desecrating the original home of our salt mother. The dam failed in its first year. The other dams and reservoirs that followed in the wake of Black Rock's failure were also poorly engineered and not maintained, and they effectively ended our traditional farming practices practices that have been successful for generations. Today, our five irrigation units are largely useless and need to be re-engineered and rebuilt. The pending settlement will allow us to rehabilitate our five irrigation units in a manner suited to climatic conditions as well as our traditional irrigation practices. It will provide us with funds to replace our aged municipal water system, including a water treatment facility capable of addressing the high levels of contaminants occurring in our groundwater, and construct a modern wastewater treatment facility that will allow us to reuse our water instead of allowing it to evaporate in outdated sewage lagoons. For Zuni to sustain and grow, we must have modern, safe, and reliable drinking water and wastewater services. The settlement will provide funds for livestock, watering facilities, and community water hauling stations. It will also provide funds to restore the Zuni River and real neutral channels to support water flows, including for ecological and traditional purposes. The real neutral is the last place on the planet where the endangered bluehead sucker can be found. In addition to resolving the tribe's water rights in the Zuni River Basin, the settlement legislation will ensure the continuation of protections for the Zuni Salt Lake 
and the surrounding sanctuary and provide for transfers to the tribe in trust of approximately nine sections of BLM land surrounding the lake. The Zuni Lake is located approximately 60 miles south of Zuni in a remote area that is primarily used for grazing and hunting. The lake and sanctuary are sacred to our tribe and other tribes and pueblos in New Mexico and Arizona. For centuries, our people have conducted pilgrimages to the lake to pray and gather salt for ceremonial and domestic uses. The lake and surrounding caldera are the defining geographic feature in this otherwise desolate part of New Mexico. Ratification of our settlement by Congress is of in enormous importance to my community and its future. It will usher in what I sincerely believe will be the new chapter for our tribe, allowing us to protect and sustainably develop our community's limited water resources to restore traditional agricultural, to facilitate much needed economic development and to protect cultural resources that are integral to our beliefs and traditions. It will also allow us to adapt to the growing impacts of climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and we are pleased to also welcome the Honorable Tanya Lewis, the Chairwoman of the Yavapai Apache Nation in Camp Verde, Arizona. Welcome. Thank you. Tagote. My name is Tanya Lewis. I'm the Chairwoman for the Yavapai Apache Nation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I would also like to express my gratitude to Senator Kelly and also Senator Cinema for introducing and co-sponsoring S4705 and for their steadfast advocacy for our tribe and our water settlement. As I speak to you today, I stand on the shoulders of my ancestors and to Licho, the Verde River, a living being in the center of our cultural and religious way of life. The passage of this legislation is vital for us to secure a future of clean water and permanent homeland for the Yavape and Dilje'e people. My people have called the Verde Valley home since the beginning of time. And it is time for us to access the water guaranteed in our treaty with the United States. S4705 fulfills this long overdue promise by providing a secure water supply for our reservation and preserving our groundwater resources. This settlement will also help protect the Verde River, ensuring the Arizona's last free-flowing river continues to thrive for future generations. In the face of Arizona's ongoing drought, we must take concrete and generational actions to meet our community's long-term needs. Like our counterparts in Metro Phoenix who benefit from hist historic federal reclamation investments, we too must have access to modern water infrastructure to use and protect our reserve water rights under this settlement. To grasp the importance of this settlement, one must understand my nation's history and our deep-rooted relationship with the Verde River and the Verde Valley. Our ancestral homelands covers over 16,000 square miles across central Arizona. When gold was discovered in the 1800s, a rush of settlers claimed our land, used our water, and decimated the wildlife we relied on. This ultimately escalated into a larger conflict known as the Apache Wars. Intent on ending the conflict, President Grant established the Camp Verde Indian Reservation in 1871. It was to be our new permanent homeland where we were told we would remain undisturbed by non-Indian settlers. We, came, we became productive and profitable farmers. In fact, an irrigation ditch we hand dug in 1874 is still in operation today as the Cottonwood Ditch. However, our prosperity was short-lived. Due to pressure from settlers to open the Camp Verde Reservation on February 27, 1875, 1,476 of our people, young and old, pregnant and infirm, were force marched 180 miles through the Matazel Mountains in the dead of winter to the San Carlos Reservation, where efforts were made to try and persuade the federal agent in charge to take a route around the mountains using wagons and horses. He responded, they are Indians, let the beggars walk. 
More than 100 of our people died on that treacherous journey. Shortly after President Grant terminated the Camp Verde Reservation, allowing non-Indians to build their lives and communities using the land, water, and other resources that were guar once guaranteed to my people. President Grant did not terminate our water rights to the Verde River. However, the United States permitted others to use our water, and in doing so, the state of Arizona prospered while my people suffered. By 1890, with the end of the Apache Wars, my ancestors began their return home to the Verde Valley, mostly on foot. However, upon returning, we found no established reservation or land base of any kind. In 1809, with the assistance of our Indian agent, we purchased back just over 18 acres along the Verde River. Since then, we have acquired more land for our reservation, but we still lack sufficient land to meet the housing needs of our membership. Many of our tribal members left off the reservation and scattered throughout the Verde Valley. We hope to add 3,206 acres to our reservation through an administrative land exchange with the Forest Service, which we have worked on for many years. This expansion is essential for providing housing for our growing membership and fostering economic development. Without a new water resource, we cannot meet our com community's current or future needs as our local groundwater supplies are diminishing in both quantity and quality. This poses a serious threat to my people's health. Like all communities, we must secure the water necessary for our growth and prosperity. This legislation will finally grant us what the United States promised us in the 1852 Apache Treaty. On behalf of the Yavapai Apache Nation and our ancestors, Ahia, for this opportunity. Thank you very much for your powerful testimony, and it is a reminder of the dark history of the federal government's policy of extermination and then assimilation. Um, before my time, with my two predecessors, Dan Inouye and Dan Akaka, Congress passed and the president signed the apology resolution, which, which apologized officially for the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. And I know what I say doesn't have the same weight as a bill passing Congress and ratified uh, and signed by the president, but um, the vice chair and I were talking about what the Navy did in Southeast Alaska and elsewhere. And so for whatever it's worth, uh, I apologize uh, on behalf of the federal government. Now, the work in front of us is to improve the material condition of native communities across the country, and we will endeavor to do that. But I didn't want to let this moment pass without acknowledging the deep, deep immoral injustice imposed by the federal government. So thank you for that. Uh, my first question is for uh, Chairman White Clay. Uh, you testified that, you're, that this bill is important to your tribe's economic development plans, and I very much want to respect that. My question is just how the profit will be seen. Um, as written, the bill mentions a revenue sharing agreement, but does not actually require one. And, you know, in the legislative business, we're very careful to notice the difference between may versus shall. Um, is that satisfactory to the tribe? Yes. Um, just to answer on the bigger picture, um, we've seen a 95% reduction in revenue um, from the Psalogai mine to today. So, yes, um, the question there is it we do have an agreement a material agreement with the hope on a revenue sharing with through signal peaks through the three part agreement on there okay um and the revenue sharing agreement is between the tribe and the hope family for the hope family trust tracts but not the bull mountain tracts so it's my understanding that the hope family tracts are unlikely to be mined if the bill is changed to the bill Bull Mountains tracks, do you know how much revenue the tribe can expect? At current projections, the tribe is expected to receive on a minimum $100 million um, dollars with, a, with the agreement being $10 million a year for 10 years. Is this the same profit that you would get from the Hope tracks? Um, this is, yeah, this is within the same profit of the Hope crap. The Hope tracks will... 
more than likely not be developed on the reservation because all mining in Montana, like we've seen currently with the Columbus mine and other mines that are being shut down um, throughout that no new development on the reservation will be taking place. But under the Bull Mountain Mine, the export of the coal tonnage, that's where the Crow tribe would benefit. Okay, um, and Secretary uh, Newland, as the trustee here, or the representative for the trustee, um, can you talk to me about this revenue sharing provision as it's currently written and whether you have any recommendations here? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As is, as is currently drafted in the, in the bill, it speaks to the Hope family track within the reservation. And so the language as currently drafted would, contemplates an agreement for revenue sharing for resources that would be held in trust for the Crow tribe. Um, and so it's, it, you know, as, as trustee, I, I, my question is why there would be an agreement with a third party for the development of resources that belong to the tribe within the reservation. Thank you. Um, my final question on this one is, um, according to the Mon Montana Department of State Lands, the Bull Mountain Tract contains tribal cultural resources, including vision quest sites, rock art sites, and burial and traditional use areas for multiple tribes. Is that your understanding of the site? Um, yes, currently um, with our personal tipple, with the tribal, the Crow Tribes TIPO program, we're being very much involved on these sites. Um, previously, what happens in the Crow Reservation, what happens with other mining agreements that they get a third party um, contractor as their cultural person on, on deck, which we see right now, our tribe is in a current process of reburying a Buffalo site that was upended by Westmoreland. And it was um, approved by a third party, non-tribal cultural preservation officer a company. And so with this current site, it'll be a Crow tribal preservation officer from the Crow tribe to be able to sign off on these cultural sites. Okay, th thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Secretary Newland, are DOIs a 19... 90 criteria and procedures for the Indian water rights settlement still relevant? And let me just put that another way. Are they still useful to evaluate whether DOI should support the, set, the settlements being contemplated today? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, most tribes that we've heard from would say no. Uh, those criteria and procedures are, are rooted in a, 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 you know, a notion of protecting the department from liability. Uh, and that is uh, from tribes. And that's not where policy is. Now our policy is more toward uh, not viewing tribes as legal adversaries, but as uh, our partners and as trustee. And uh, so, in my final time, what do we need to do to fix that? Well, I think the the way to approach these settlements is to view it as what is our obligation to make sure that Indian people can live in their homelands. And so that that's the one. that's the principle. But how do we do it? Is it a is it a rule change? Is it a is it a process? Is it a circular like memorandum? Do you need a law? The, how do we do this? The criteria and procedures are are a policy of the department that was published, and so that uh, that exists right now. Those standards within the department. But uh, it's, it would be within the department's power to change that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman uh, White Clay, thank you for your testimony, and um, thank you all for your testimony here today. But let me start with you, and, and this follows on the chairman's uh, question here about the uh, the intent to require a revenue sharing agreement between the tribe and and, and the uh, private landowner not being in, in entirely specific here. Would you be open to making uh, amendments to the bill to make that intent clearer in terms of the revenue sharing agreement? Um, yes, of course. Um, <clears throat> I'd be fully open to be making any amendments on these bills to make it more um, solidifying to where the tribe would benefit, also to make it more clear to the committee um, as we move forward to try to get this passed through. Mr. Chairman, could, could I ask, just make a point here to clear this sure. up? Sure, okay. If I, I think it's, it's, it's germane to this discussion. Um, there was a drafting error in the bill. 
it referenced the wrong subsection in the revenue sharing agreement. I have an amendment drafted to correct that error. Uh, the intent and purpose of the bill is to facilitate a revenue sharing agreement between the tribe and the Hope family for the minerals developed at the mine. Uh, we'll work to get the sort out. But there was just, it was a drafting error. It gets corrected. We've got the amendment on it. I just want to put that kind of to rest now because I know there's been some questions on it. Thank I you. For I appreciate little, the response yeah. to that. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, Secretary Newland, let me ask you about uh, the... Uh, S4633 and 4705, the, the, the settlement acts. Um, uh, and, and again, I, I really appreciate the efforts that so many have gone into to, to, to get to this place. Um, but the committee did receive a letter from the water commissioners from the state of Wyoming, state of Utah, opposing the bill. Uh, I'm going to add that letter to the record and would ask for UC on that. But I, I recognize that the concerns may be technical. Uh, the department's very familiar with them. We had an opportunity uh, to, to speak to, to President uh, Nigren earlier today about this and their ongoing efforts um, to, to address some of the concerns. But what's the department's interpretation of the objections that are raised uh, by the water commissioners from Wyoming and, and Utah? And just as I heard um, from the president here uh, about their efforts to continue these discussions. Uh, are you also working with the tribes and the bill sponsors and the water commissioners to try to find a path forward on this? So if you can just address where we are with that. Sure. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, I'm aware that the tribes have been working with their counterparts from some of the upper basin states and, and the department has uh, been supportive of those conversations. We continue to advocate for a consensus based approach across the basin, given the uh, enormous challenges uh, that uh, folks face all across the, both the upper and lower basins. Uh, so this negotiation is ongoing. Um, as uh, I laid out in the department's testimony, you know, we, there are some things that we still have to address yet, and I think we're working toward that. We've made uh, progress uh, even since the last time these bills came up on the House side, um, and so we're going to continue to work with um, everybody who's interested to make sure there's a consensus-based approach to resolving these base, uh, Colorado River upper and lower basin issues. Okay, well, I... I and one who believes that when we got everybody here, you've got good faith efforts that have been um, uh, underway to try to advance them. We want we want to encourage you to find those solutions because, as smart as we are uh, on all of these issues, um, it is it is it is your lands, it is your people, it is the water that we're talking about. And I think the better solution is going to be that negotiated uh, solution that you can come to us for that final. Adoption. So I would just encourage you in that. Uh, I'd also like to ask about the the concerns that the department raised um, about the budgets in, in these settlement acts. Uh, in the written testimony, you note that both bills may not properly provide appropriations for covering potential cost overruns for these projects. Can you Describe with uh, for us the concerns that you might have, uh, what you think the cost estimates might actually be for both of these projects, if you know it. And and again, are you working with, with the tribes and the bill sponsors to address these? I'm sorry, Vice Chair, this is the Northeastern Arizona and uh, what, what was yeah. the second bill? Northeast uh, and the uh, Yavapachi, Yavapai Apache. Right. Um, I don't want to misspeak. Sorry, I skipped yeah, over yeah, to the next yeah. one. Yeah, I don't want to misspeak by giving you a, a wrong number. Um, so I'd be happy to follow up uh, okay. on those. But again, um, you know, we're we're working in both both cases with all of the tribes. Uh, these are very challenging areas geographically um, to build some of this infrastructure, and we recognize that. Uh, so you know, we're we're doing our best to address them, and I can get I can follow up and get you the numbers you're looking for. And, and again, just encouragement um, with working with the tribes and the bill sponsors and the committee to address some of the concerns that you have outlined in your testimony there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Senator Tester. Yeah, I want to start by thanking you, Chairman Schatz, and uh, Vice Chairman Kauska for having the hearing today. And thank you all for your testimony, and a special thank you to 
Chairman Whiteclay from, uh, from the Crow Reservation in Montana. Uh, Chairman Whiteclay has, display, has displayed tremendous leadership on issues that are important to his tribe over the years. Uh, he's worked to build up a tribe's youth program and uh, had incredible results in a short period of time. You need to be congratulated on He's also a champion for clean drinking water. And if there's one message that is here by all the people, is water is life, and uh, there's no doubt about that. Just last week, we were able to pass our Bipartisan Crow Water Settlement Amendments Act through the committee, which is a huge deal for the Crow Tribe, that because it wants to deliver clean water to its communities. And I appreciate why Clay has been clear that this water bill is a priority, and I look forward to get it passed before the end of the year. You can remind me of that, by the way. Today, the committee is learning about a revenue shortage that's facing the Crow Tribe. And I want to be clear from the get-go, I'm committed to helping the tribe address this revenue challenge. One approach that's being developed as a potential solution is this Crow Revenue Act that we're taking up today. I want to make sure, though, that the Crow tribe doesn't end up on a short end of the stick. Uh, the Crow Revenue Act uh, could potentially provide the tribe with additional revenue, badly needed additional revenue, over the next few years by transferring land and mineral rights between a private entity and the federal government. I'm a strong defender of public lands, and I've always said that the best land management comes from the folks when they work together and they collaborate and come up with ideas and solutions on the ground. That's why I'm glad to see so many Montanans submitted comments for the record today and I look forward to reviewing them in the coming weeks. I'm also glad we have an opportunity to ask some questions because this is a complex bill that affects revenue for a number of entities uh, and affects our public lands. So for you, Chairman, uh, I appreciate your comments in the opening statement. One issue that keeps coming up is a concern about the revenue sharing component of this legislation. It's something that uh, Chairman Schatz talked about, and maybe your amendment takes care of it, Steve, I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, I know your intent for the supporting this legislation is to help the tribe bridge the gap and, and the shortfalls that you've been facing. However, I'm hearing concerns that the bill as written doesn't have strong enough guarantees that the tribe will benefit financially. Uh, and I'm sure that you've heard from folks as well. I heard from one of the folks sitting behind you this morning. Uh, could you address those concerns? Um, thank you, uh, Senator Tester, for um, that and also for pass helping us with our water amendments. You bet. Um, that's been another thing that I've been cleaning up. Um, we've had that since 2010. And I'm happy to be able to pick up the ball and finish that project out. Um, with this um, bill coming out that it helps with our revenue sharing, like we talked about earlier, we heard about the missing murdered. My reservation is ground zero for the missing and murdered. You see all the documentaries. Um, and that's why I've been pushing so hard to be able to get a revenue replacement from the Psalga and mine because, like I said before, in my talks and my testimony here we weren't a part of any of the federal funding that came down we on invalid debts that were given to the crow tribe based on do not pay list um it was a very hurtful for the tribe during that time to be able to receive those grants because all these services all the funds all the search and rescues and everything that comes out with that we had 68 this year comes on the back of our general fund, which is now super um, in danger of being completely depleted from our revenue from closure of our mine. So finding a replacement to do all these services was um, very um, on my agenda yep. because we're going to hit a cliff right now. We're going to fall off a cliff. The Crow Tribe is going to fall off a cliff where we previously had 12 million coming in with only 1 million for projected revenues for next year which means the next year we're gonna have to find out how i'm gonna pay for elders search and rescue clean water getting all these other services out to the tribes but as we all know the devil's in the details on these things where the tribe can benefit and i have a lot of folks that are working on this bill to tighten it up and getting amendments between the three different parties and also with um Dane's amendment to tighten up all the finances to make sure the tribe benefits from there. But like we said before, time is of the essence on this because the projected revenue is next couple weeks. So 
Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll stay for a second. Bro. Senator James. Great. Thank you. By the way, kudos to my colleagues and the staff for catching this error. It really is because without having that fix in Section 3, it goes from A2 to A3, there's a disconnect in the revenue. It's a, it's a technical error that I think that addresses the whole revenue share piece, and um, we'll get that fixed here with this, with this uh, technical change. Look, this is a crucial piece of legislation, as the chairman just alluded to. You talk about falling off a cliff from a revenue viewpoint, as I've been battling for the, with the Crows and for the Crow tribe for many, many years, making sure you all can develop your resources. This is about sovereignty and self-determination for your land. Uh, this is widely supported by the local communities and Montana officials. Uh, as you can see behind me, the Crow Revenue Act is supported by the Crow Tribe. That's the most important support we have, the Crow Tribe. The city of Roundup, Montana, Muscleshell County, Yellowstone County, Bighorn County, the Montana Association of Oil, Gas, and Coal Counties, six local state lawmakers, Governor Gianforte, Congressman Zinke, Congressman Rosendale, the Montana Superintendent of Public Construction, Elsie Arnson, and many more. And uh, Chairman Schatz, I ask unanimous consent to add to the record all the letters of support that we have received. Without objection. This bill is, thank you, this bill is a win-win for Montana, for local communities, and most importantly, for the Crow tribe and the Crow people. It's simple. The Crow Revenue Act is going to swap private inholdings on the Crow Reservation for federal minerals near Roundup, Montana. In exchange, the Crow Tribe would receive a share of the revenues from these minerals developed near Roundup. Montana can't afford to lose the jobs at the Bull Mountain Mine. Let me be clear. Without the passage of the Crow Revenue Act, the Bull Mountains Mine near Roundup will begin to close down at the beginning of 2025. Let that sink in for a moment. Hundreds of jobs are on the line if this committee and this Congress does not pass this bill. After the recent announcement of 700 mining jobs lost there at the Stillwater Mine, that's just south of Big Timber in Columbus, Montana, we can't afford another mass layoff of Montana miners. That's palladium. There's just a few places in the world that produce palladium. One of them is Russia. It's Russian dumping of imports, cheap imports that are causing the huge problems we're seeing right now at this Montana mine. Unfortunately, we're in this position because this administration has refused to complete the Bull Mountains mine permit, pure and simple. Had the administration done their job, completed the needed permits in July like they were supposed to, we wouldn't be here talking about needing to do this bill but they've purposely dragged their feet so this mine will close. We're not going to let that happen. I urge my colleagues to join me in ensuring these jobs and the revenue for the communities for the Crow Tribe can continue on. Chairman White Clay, could you explain to the committee how this bill benefits the Crow Tribe and why it's needed and why it's needed now? Um, thank you, Senator Danes. We have 952 elders that depend on our revenue from the Crow, from our Absalogai mine. That's 952, 67 and older. Um, we also have all of our social service programs. Um, all together, just um, in the Crow tribe, 421 jobs. Say, um, say that again. How many Crow, how many jobs? 421 jobs. And how do these jobs compare in terms of pay and benefits to other jobs? Um, they're at a higher rate for pay within the area of Montana, but that also, through my local community, Hardin, that also kind of supplements to that community, which the dollar turns over in there. Um, also, the Crow Tribal Government, those are the Crow tribal government jobs. And so all together, we, in the whole area, it's going to affect close to 600 jobs. It's going to affect 952 elders, 67 and older, which we provide an elder benefit every year. Um, Senator Tester alluded to where I've cleaned up a lot of the issues from my, the, my predecessor. I, I've cleaned up so much and spent so many resources on cleaning up all the previous mistakes. We've done five years worth of audits in my four years from previous years. 
We've done single audits. We've got off the do not pay list where 137 tribes are on that do not pay list. One tribe got out without paying a penny, which we spent resources to get out of that and to be able to receive federal grants on that, which also includes foster care, social services, health care, tribal benefits, diabetes programs, all of the um, encompassing social programs of the reservation are contingent upon this, which it wouldn't have been a problem. We had a long-term plan on the closure of our ex one customer in Minnesota on Excel Energy, and they expedited the closure of that mine, which gave us the cliff that we're falling off today. Could you dispel some of the rumors that this bill does not support the tribe or this exchange will hurt the tribe? I mean, we have the chairman of the Crow tribe. There's rumors swirling about this. I want you to set the record straight. Um, yes, um, as we are in national politics, we are also in tribal politics. This is my election year, and as bad as national politics get, Crow tribe politics are cutthroat. You know? <laughs> so um, the rumors that some of the candidates, their puppets, their pawns, everybody else through social media and everything else is that the Crow tribe will not benefit from this and that it's... Uh, basically a scheme that the Crow Tribe is doing this on back and to benefit the Signal Peak, which some of them, and I'm saying the ones that do know, that we have projections from Signal Peak on the funding that will come to the tribe. The revenue agreement, we've been meeting regularly for the past year with Hope Family. We've been meeting with all the parties involved and also with our um, current mine partner that's closing now westmoreland and we have their projections but and all in all to me it's a win we're receiving historic lands our lands are very much um we have a high number of non-tribal ownership and it's been my administration's um duty to try to re consolidate these tribal lands and to bring those lands back into tribal inventory and ownership and this will start that but also it gives us a 10-year plan to keep our head above water and to create and diversify our economy and this isn't just the only thing the crow tribe is doing we also with the amendment that's coming through we're building a hydro dam project to uh, bring renewable energy to the reservation we're br bringing out solar projects we're bringing out wind projects all these other things that are being and diversifying that but we need to use this project to get out of the business of coal we're working on that chairman thanks for that very strong answer i have a quick question for secretary newland and it's simply this in your testimony you said and i quote you support the bill's goals of addressing inholdings within the boundaries of the Crow Indian Reservation and providing an additional source of revenue for the Crow Tribe. My question for you, Secretary Newland, will you commit to working with myself and Chairman White Clay to strengthen the bill and get it to the President's desk? And Chairman Schatz. <laughs> and especially Chairman Schatz. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Senator. We've outlined our, our, uh, the Department's concerns uh, in the bill, uh, in the nature, you know, uh, I think highlighting a path forward uh, to addressing those concerns would be happy to work with the committee uh, and the tribe, uh, as we have on the do not pay list and other things uh, to, uh, you know, talk through those those changes that need to be made. Sir, no, thank you. I know you just put a smile on uh, Chairman White Clay's face. <laughs> I can see it. Thank Thanks. you, Mr. Senator Chairman, Lujan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. <clears throat> Chairman. Uh, President Nygren, the Northeastern Arizona Indian Water Rights Settlement Act of 2024 amends the Navajo San Juan Settlement by allowing the new pipeline in Arizona to connect into the Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project's San Juan Lateral, which is within the boundaries of the state of New Mexico once it is completed. Approximately how many acre feet per year do you anticipate will be diverted through Navajo Gallup infrastructure? Thank you, Senator. Uh, approximately 18,411 will be diverted uh, across to the Arizona. The testimony submitted by the state of New Mexico voices support for S4633's goals, but also highlights the challenges of leveraging infrastructure in New Mexico to complete the water settlement in Arizona. 
Uh, President Nigren, I know that you and your staff have been working closely with the state of New Mexico to find legislative language that will work for all parties. Will you continue to work with the Navajo Gallup parties, including the state of New Mexico, to ensure that the proposed storage in S4633 will not adversely impact New Mexico water users, which includes water users within the northern agency in the state's boundaries, the eastern agency, and the Fort Defiance agency within the state of New Mexico's boundaries? Thank you, Senator. We're going to continue to have those uh, good discussions that we've been having at the state of New Mexico so that, so that those concerns are addressed and those dialogues have been going really well for us. So thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, can I interpret that as a resounding yes? Yes. Yep. I, I appreciate that. Assistant Secretary Newland, um, as we are considering this new infrastructure project in Arizona, we are at the same time trying to finish its, com finish its companion uh, which is in New Mexico, a piece of legislation I was proud to carry back in 2009. What concerns does Interior have, if any, about the connection of the Arizona and New Mexico infrastructure projects and resources available to complete them? Thank you, Senator. I, I think just uh, speaking more broadly, we are uh, you know, focused on ensuring that uh, while we're uh, enacting water settlements and authorizing appropriations, that we're meeting our commitment uh, to uh, work with Congress to secure those appropriations to fund these projects. I appreciate that very much. That's going to be so important um, as we move through this process as well. I appreciate that. Um, Governor uh, Kukati, um, can you share with us how this legislation will improve the tribe's water security for tribal water users? Will this be primarily for agricultural, domestic, or mu uh, municipal use? <clears throat> To underscore your question, this settlement would really help the, the people of Zuni, would really help the people of Zuni to replace our aged municipal water system and also looking at uh, water treatment facility that's capable of addressing the high levels of contaminants that we're currently going through in terms of uh, making sure that we have um, upgraded water um, supply and then also to be able to construct a modern wastewater treatment facility that would allow us to reuse our water instead of allowing it to evaporate into outdated sewage lagoons. So basically, you know, this is something that is really very significant in terms of the settlement itself. And likewise, in terms of the protection for the Zuni Salt Lake area, this is a very unique sacred area like nowhere else where our uh, sacred salt mother's you know home is and and so those are the critical areas that we're we're really looking at to making sure that we're going to focus our our interest in 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 those areas of development and also to make sure that we also uh, have the ability to rehabilitate our five irrigation units in a manner that's suited to climate conditions that's very very detrimental to our traditional irrigational practices because when I was a child I grew up along the Zuni River and the Rio Nutria, where it was a very abundant with families growing, you know, agriculture. And I think my people really deserve to have that be brought back to their way of life in terms of our traditional ways of survival. I appreciate that, Governor. Assistant Secretary Newland, S4998 complements S595 by ratifying an addendum to the Rio San Jose Settlement Agreement. If both are enacted, all tribal water rights in the Rio San Jose Basin would be resolved. Would resolving water rights in this basin, or what would water, what would resolving the water rights uh, mean for the three tribes and for the United States as a trustee if we can get this done? Well, it would, uh, it would bring water to people who need it, uh, and it would uh, reduce or, or eliminate a lot of the contentious claims and disputes that have existed over that water in the first place. And so I think it's a, it's a net benefit for everybody who has an interest. I appreciate that. And Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair, thank you so much for this important hearing. Um, this is just another reminder of water that was stolen and diverted and taken. And it takes money. But I certainly hope that with all of these that we can find a path forward to find the language necessary to correct them, but get these all done. I, I just appreciate your attention with water settlements as well and look forward to doing everything I can to work with you and your teams to find resolution to these by the end of the year. Uh, thank you both, I yield.
Thank you very much, Senator Lujan. And we appreciate your leadership on water settlements and all of these issues for Indian country across the country, but also obviously in your, in your home state of New Mexico. If there are no more, more questions for our witnesses, members may also submit follow-up written questions for the record. The hearing record will be open for four weeks. I want to thank all of the witnesses for their time and their testimony today, and this hearing is adjourned.